There's not one guy, one person in the history of this program that's bigger than the program. What's better than this? Guys being dudes. Ooh, what's up and welcome into episode number 33 of the Program Guys podcast. My name is Mason Prince. Joined with you as always by Mark Hall, Matt Gann, Ryan Tice, and no Patrick Kurtzberger this week. Today is Monday or Tuesday, Tuesday, August 23rd. Be sure to like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Be sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. We're trying to get to 1,000 subs on our YouTube channel by the end of the year. You guys are helping us out. Just over 650 this week, boys. Thank you so much to our listeners being part of the program. You can find us on Twitter at Program Guys with a Z, on Instagram, Program Guys with a Z, Facebook, Program Guys Podcast. Boys, how are we doing? I'm hurting, man. My bachelor party was this weekend, and all these boys came yeah, it out was. and celebrated with me. And uh, let me tell you, yesterday might have been one of the worst days of my life, uh, driving 10 hours back from Louisville to Oklahoma. You guys did choose to drive. I know. This, is a, this was a personal choice. Mason. We did. 100%. <laughs> uh, we originally, when we planned to drive, we're going to have five people to split gasoline five ways. And two of those people bailed. So uh, we were then left with three. Nice. Uh, one of my friends, Jake, drove the first five hours. I drove two hours and had to tap out because I was dying on the inside. Mm. And then I made uh, Matt, my beautiful fiance's brother, drive the rest of the way. And then he had to drive four hours home to Kansas from that on. Yeah, I know. Yes. Pretty tough. Pretty tough look for me. But you're the bachelor. That's I know, the game. Right? Yeah. That's the game. What I you know. want, you get. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Louisville, but, uh, Louisville won. Us guys, zero. You know what I'm saying? Zero. So, true. Now the weekend. Very, very up. true. Maybe is like zero, zero or is it like negative, like 50? You also yeah. think pretty close. In, in a way, and you all know the way, it was really Louisville too. All of us guys, zero. Yeah. So, Correct. Correct. Know. Yeah. Yep. It's tough. Uh, it's swindled. Tough. Swindled out a couple. Into, yeah. yeah. Swindled yeah. out in the Ville. But, you know, that's okay. You know what I am excited about? If you've stuck around with us for the first two minutes of Mason rehashing how bad he feels, I'm here to tell you right now, I'm going to power through because you know what we're doing? We're talking some Sooner football because there's a game next week. There's Mm. a actual live football game next week. It counts. It matters. It's against a team, UTEP. They're, they're a thing, but we're not going to talk about the UTEP game yet. This, folks, is going to be our 2022 positional preview episode. So right now, if you're joining us, we're going through all the positions. We're going to go through some battles. We're going to go through some guys who are certified, solidified starters, maybe some guys you should be on the lookout for as the season progresses for each position. And while you're watching this, be sure to comment on our video below. Who are you excited to see? What position battle are you excited to see? Love seeing the comments this week on our bold prediction segment. Had some great predictions from the fans, as well as telling us where we were right and wrong, mostly telling Matt where he was wrong. Matt, before we get started, defend your honor, because people were roasting you in the comments. Roasting. Yeah. Yeah. Roasting. I was on a over a fire pit uh, as I was reading those comments. And listen, right for you, so I should have... Done a little bit more research on my end to look at DG's actual TD to intercept ratio, which is like 74 to something. It's like a five plus one. So, yeah, it's not hard to look up. Like, it's, it's not. not, it's not it, hard. I could go to Google and type it right in and I get in less than 10 seconds. So, yeah. I appreciate the viewers keeping me honest. Good. I should bump mine up instead of two to one to five to one just to make it a little bit more of a bolder prediction. So, is this a revision? Uh, is this, this is or, this is <laughs> if I'm allowed to make one mul- one yeah. mulligan? Please. Okay, fine. One yeah. mulligan. Breakfast ball. Go ahead. Breakfast ball. Let's uh, revise it to to five and one for uh, my bold pre- prediction for DG. Five. You came one. in, Matt. That. You came in so hot last week about just like Mark being so wrong. But like you, yeah, say but nobody that? called me out on it except for the viewers. So you I'm say okay five with that. to one. Everyone no, called, I called you, you out, out on it. Chad <laughs> once so fast in the spring. I was so everyone. Mad that. Everyone yeah. said you were. Hey, remember that Marcus Major one, Mark? Remember that one? Yeah, I think mine's gonna. 
We're I about think to mine's going to prove today. pretty correct. Oh, all right, let's get right. <laughs> all right, boys, we're going to start with the offense. Let's go ahead and all get right. – no, you're all good. Listen, how many times has Boston barked on this podcast or done something? So we're going to start with the quarterback position just because it's the easiest. Dylan Gabriel, he's your, he's your starter, and he's your solidified starter. Been a lot of talk by a lot of OU experts, and I won't use quotes because they are OU experts, but they've – They've said that if Dylan Gabriel goes down, this team's in a whole heap and lot of trouble. And I tend to agree with that because if the reported backup is going to be Davis Bevel, then yeah. I mean, yeah, you're yep. you're in trouble. It's got to be Dylan Gabriel. Like, there's no shot that even if Gabriel goes down for two games – that automatically is going to feel like two losses for me, unless you're playing like Kansas or maybe Tech. It's a significant drop-off, right? And we all know that DG is the guy. He was the guy from day one. Once he transferred in, OU knew this is our guy. I mean, he threw for 8,000 yards, 70 touchdowns at UCF. He's got the most experience. He's got a connection with Jeff Lebby in the system. This is our guy. And and you're right. It only takes one play, you know, God forbid for something to happen. And then all of a sudden it's next man up. But that's truly, I think, one thing we truly don't know who the next guy is. Is it Nick Evers? Is it Davis Bettle? Like you just said, the guy that I think maybe could step in is my boy General Booty from the JUCO transfer. And the only reason just because he led JUCO in passing yards per game, he was fourth in touchdowns, and he's got – you know, again, I, I don't know, Juco experience, but I don't know, maybe General Booty is a guy that maybe could step in and, you know, solidify that second spot. But it is a significant drop off for sure after DG. That is worrisome. Mark Ryan, your thoughts on on who would be a solid backup or even just a serviceable one at that? Yeah, so the all the reports out of practice are that it's Davis Bevel who's kind of getting those reps, right? Mm-hmm. He's kind of solidified at the two, and then maybe it, 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 Ralph Rucker at the three. No, Micah Bowen. Not yeah, Rucker, I was Bowen. Bowen. Yeah, I heard Bowen. That, yeah, 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 has has jumped in, uh, which is hey, cool for him. He's been he's been around forever. It feels like and hasn't ever hit the field, but yeah, I I tend to think. I mean, I'm sure they're seeing something with Bevel, right? But I'm also surprised that Booty hasn't kind of taken that backup role by the reins a little bit more. He actually led Juco colleges in passing last year as a true freshman through 27 touchdowns. He had a very successful season. And sure, sometimes it doesn't scale up. Sometimes that doesn't translate in the same kind of way, but he has game experience in a different way than I think Davis Bevel does. So that's just where I would land on it personally. And I am interested to see where it shakes out. Hope it never, I hope I never see where it shakes out actually, but just, well, I mean, Bevel is getting like the Blake Bell treatment, right? Like, I mean, he's a huge dude, six, six, yeah. like two twenty three. Like he's going to be, uh, he might be even like used in those short, like goal line formations yeah, that we could used be. to use Bell in all the time. So, I mean, I understand why that could be considered like the backup, but if, if Gabriel actually goes down, like, does he have the skill set to be able to do it all? I don't know. I don't think so probably, but like, we're going to have to figure it out. Like Mark said, we really don't want this to happen. We hope this doesn't happen. And there's, and <laughs> There's in my mind, there's no position. Obviously, this is gonna count sound like duh, obviously, but there's no position that's more important to this team than the quarterback position. This particular yeah. team, there's no position that's more important than the quarterback. Because you look at it back in the day, you know, when Baker was in his heyday and Kyler was his backup. If you lost Baker, Kyler comes in and you still feel kind of okay. Like he's not Baker Mayfield at that point, but you were still excited. Dylan Gabriel, if he goes down, you got a whole bunch of dudes who haven't done anything. And that's pretty stressful. I mean, we lost our we lost our two five star quarterbacks last year, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is not 
surprising that this is kind of our quote unquote transition year when it comes to quarterbacks, right? We have Nick Evers came in and that's awesome, but we have Jackson Arnold coming in next year. I mean, I'm going to feel a lot better about this situation next year than I do sure. this year. And I think probably most of us will, but like this year is a transitional year for us, even though we're talking about how great it's going to be. Technically it is transitional. And we see that probably the most in our quarterback room. It's see, a good point. Dylan Gabriel's got three years of eligibility left, though. Yeah. That's the weird thing is I'm wondering. It's weird, right? Because I don't. He's not as talented as Jackson Arnold. He's not as talented as probably Nick Evers. But three years of eligibility left. If he comes in and just takes over this year, what's it look like next year with Jackson Arnold coming into camp? And the year after that, when he's got one more year of eligibility and Jackson is looking to the next year for his own football draft. Yeah. Interesting stuff. I don't know. We're project. I'm projecting way too far out there, but the three years of eligibility complicates things. That's all. Um, I'm, I'm expecting great things out of Dylan this year. He's going to get a lot of passes. So it, I, I think he, the stats are going to be there for sure. I don't think I realized he was only 5'11". He's small, small. Yeah. Like that's smaller than Baker small and not fast. Yeah. And our O-line last year, not the best. <laughs> We're hoping yeah, for improvement be the best. this year. They're going to be the best this year. <laughs> according to you, Mace. <laughs> I know. According to me. Let's move on to the running backs. We'll talk some running backs. Now, Eric Gray is the guy who is the starter right now. We can, we can say that he's going to be the guy who gets the bulk of the carries to start the season at least. We all have different guys that we love in this group. I tend to believe that it's going to be a one-two punch with Eric Gray and Marcus Major, and Marcus Major being kind of the third down change of pace guy, and Eric continue to be that guy on first and second down who can catch passes out of the backfield. That's how I feel. Anybody else feel differently or more excited about some other guys on this in this roster spot? I know, I know Mark feels differently. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I (laughs) kind of did this last week, I guess. Yeah, last week Mm -hmm. with Marcus Major, I think he is going to end up taking the Lions share of the role of the the carries. You know, I think he is going to end up taking that first, second down, maybe even third down role. And Eric Gray will be the one spelling him. I think you look at body type he's just more built for taking carry after carry after carry i looked up Ole miss's stats last year and they ran over a hundred more rushes than oklahoma did last year the opportunities are going to be there the guys that we have returning on the roster are they they have a grand total of 179 carries between all of them our Crazy. two highest rushers kennedy brooks and caleb williams uh, they accounted for 70% of our rushing yards last year. So there's going to be opportunities there. And I just don't know if Eric Gray is the most talented guy that can take, just take over that position the way that I think he would have to, to be the guy. Matt. Yeah, and I, and I meant to say this for my context, for my list, and we're going to go position group by position group. I'm going to do the year of the transfers and newcomers. So I'm going to list at least one transfer guy or a guy that's a freshman coming into the program because I know one of the main stats that BB talked about was, what, 50 60% of the guys have never played a snap for OU. Yep. So this is going to be very important to this year, at least, until he gets his recruiting classes in and we have a little bit more of a predictable depth chart. This is what I'm going with. So obviously General Booty was my quarterback I went with, the JUCO transfer. The guy I'm kind of looking at that we transferred from, the only running back, has actually been Tavius Thomas, who's also from Central Florida, who played 30 games. And 6'1", 197, has got a good frame, compiled over 1,100 yards and 13 touchdowns before leaving and transferring here. So like Mark said, there's going to be opportunities. I definitely think Eric, Eric Gray and Marcus Majors are going to be the benefactors of that. But there's a couple guys on there, Javante Barnes, Gavin, those guys. It'll be interesting to see if there's maybe a guy that just kind of comes out and maybe Bentavious Thomas is that guy, but definitely some uh, some opportunities for guys to step in. 
I think those two freshman names on this list, Javante Barnes and Gavin Sawchuk, are pretty interesting names as guys who might get some burn like later on in the year. They're true freshmen. You aren't going to throw them out there week one, week two. Yeah. But, you know, maybe maybe something happens. Somebody gets banged up or you need to change a pace down the line in week six, you know, or after the Texas game. Those are guys who I've heard have performed very well in camp. And they, first of all, they love Sawchuck's speed. They think he's blazing fast. So that's never a bad thing with a running back. And it, But again, these guys are freshmen. And you have, like Mark said, you have experience, but not experience in that room. And I think that the older guys, they're going, DeMarco's going to feel more comfortable with. And that's why, in my mind, it's just Air Gray and Marcus Major. But like, like always, people get banged up. And I think when, if and when we get to see a depth chart, you'll see those freshmen a little higher than they probably should be just because they like how they performed so far in camp. I also think if a transfer running back is, you know, just to put me against Matt again real fast, if there's a transfer running back that does break out, I don't think it's been Tavius Thompson. I think it's Tawi Walker who transferred from Palomar Co- College in uh, California to Juco. Love my Juco transfers. Ramondre Stevenson, Dede Westbrook, Hollywood Brown. These Perry guys on. just, Perry on Winfrey. These guys just, they perform for us. We know which ones to take on. And Toby Walker showed us in the spring game that he is very capable that even against the higher level of defense, and sure, they're still learning the defense, but he's still learning the offense. It's Mano Amano at that point. He was able to keep it up. He caught the ball really well in that game. I think that if there is an opening at the running back position, like I said, we don't have a lot of returning carries. That guy is someone who has shown it against people, similar to what General Booty did at the quarterback position. Maybe Toby Walker is the guy. He's he's 5'9", 220. A little bowling ball. Yeah. I think, like, like in my opinion, th- this position is Eric Gray's to lose. Like, it, I, I just think he's a senior. I think our O-line is going to be better this year. I, I think he has to prove himself, absolutely. And I think it's going to be between him and Marcus Major. I mean, that just makes the most sense. But I think you put him first, and I think he's going to get most of the carries at the start of the season. If he holds up like I expect him to, I think he'll be our leading rusher. I, I, think, I, think, that's a, I think that's a fair assessment. Remember, comment below if you uh, have another guy that you think is going to stick out at each of these positions we're talking about. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. So one more interesting thing that I, was, uh, I saw when I was researching is that Ole Miss had four players – uh, Matt Corral plus three of their running backs hit a hundred or more carries. We only had that out of Kennedy Brooks last year. Yeah. Eric Gray only yeah. had 78. He barely broke a hundred touches last year. So again, just a lot of big, big shoes to fill there. And uh, the carries are going to be there to give. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Let's move on to some wide receivers right now. I Besides the main three that we know are going to see playing time, and that's Theo Weiss, Marvin Mims, and Drake Stoops. Guys, I'm fired up about Jaden Gibson. I'm all in on the OU hype videos of him just making catches and out jumping people. That is something that I love because CD is one of my favorite OU receivers ever and it's just because he could out physical and outrun you on any part of the field no one could cover him and I feel like now that's a bold statement to say Jaden's only freshman high but bar. like huh high bar I know but like dude I'm just I'm fired up he's a guy that I'm fired up about and I want to know what you guys think who else is out there that you have your eye on I I think this position group is just so exciting. Like Mm -hmm. uh, there's just so much potential here, you know, because we do have like, you know, the big three that you talked about. I also think you can think Farouk is going to get big numbers this year. Also Um, like going back to Mark's take, I think in the spring um, I like we have weapons, but you can with what DG is able to do with his arm. I, I think it's, 
I think Lebby is going to be able to be creative with some of these newcomers, like you're saying with Gibson, with Freeman. Like, I, I have one more position on our list on the defensive side that I think is going to have a heavy impact with like freshmen, but this one, I think, especially. Um, they're going to get a few reps and we're going to be able to do some really creative things, I think, with them. Matt, what you got, man? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think we've talked about Theo Weiss enough. And, you know, I'm going to go technicalities here, but technically he did enter the transfer portal and then decided to stay with OU. So that's kind of my guy that is coming back per se. And I've talked about multiple times, Marvin Mims has got to be the clear cut number one. He's the best wide receiver on the team. He needs the ball more than 30 times than what he did last year. But I think that also only benefits Theo Weiss, who has obviously proven we've seen what happens in big games. Theo Weiss comes through. Good hands, good route running. This guy, I think both him and Mims are going to have a a pretty good duo season at wide receiver. If DG can come through in the O-line, give him uh, some time to throw. I'm really excited about those guys. Like you said, Farouk in the Oregon game, I think showed a lot too. So I'm right there with Tyson. This is an exciting group. It'll be interesting to see uh, what kind of play calling and who gets involved and how they get involved. So um, before before we get to you, Mark, sorry. I do want to say this because I meant to say it last week. We can love Drake Stoops for the player that he is and for his last name. If he is our best receiver or he gets the ball as much as he got it last year, we're not going to be a better team than we were last year. I love Drake Stoops. I think he's a talented wide receiver. He does not need to be your go-to guy because he is not Wes Welker. He is not Danny Amendola out there. He's just another guy. Can he be your third best receiver? 100% in my opinion, yes. But if he is the go-to guy on third downs or second and longs, I think that's the wrong thing. And I hope hope he proves me wrong. I do. But that's my opinion. But Mace, he's like Mr. Consistent, right? I know. It's like he catches the ball when you throw it to him. If you have like a third and three and you're going to throw the ball instead of run it in Levy's offense, like you want to throw it to someone who's going to catch it with like, Obviously, that is a stupid statement to say out loud, but he's like, he's our Mr. Reliable, I think. And I don't necessarily think we would be a worse team if he was like our main dude, because I think we're going to see a lot of improvement on the defensive side as well. But like overall, I think you're right. Like there's more talented wide receivers. We need to leverage them better. We need to utilize them better. But I just want to give credit to my boy Drake Stoops because he is Mr. Reliable and he catches the ball when you don't think he's going to catch the ball. And that's a really, really great skill set to have. Yeah. So I had three guys or three oh, big no. things that I wanted to like hit on. Right. Oh, no. And one of them was Theo Weiss, the return of Theo Weiss. I think so. If you just took his 2020 stats as a sophomore, he would have had and, and Put them against last year, right? He would have had the second most catches, the second most yards, and tied for the third most touchdowns as a sophomore, as all of our guys did last year in his absence. Um, And he's a year older. He's a father now. And he's really resonated with the new coaching staff. And those are things that matter to some players. Shout out. D.D. Westbrook. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Some players. And uh, he seems to be someone who has grown from that experience and is approaching football in a little bit more grown up of a way. So right on with Matt on that. I think he was a five star for a reason. He was showing so much promise. Let's get him in an offense that's going to toss the ball around and let him be big. Uh, Mason, your thing about uh, Jaden Gibson, Nick Anderson, too. I think it's really interesting, both of those guys. I think I think it's going to be hard for both of them to get on the field a bunch because yeah. they both play kind of the same. I mean, Nick Anderson's 6'4". Yeah. He's not much smaller than than Jaden Gibson. And uh, the, the things that I've heard are that he might be a little bit more ready right out of the gate than Jaden is. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. And my big, big number three thing, it's so fun that it's this, is... Uh, Drake Stoops is going to take a step back this year. I'm pretty Ooh. confident in it. I also was shocked to find he only had 16 catches last year. Wow. Doesn't it feel 
Like, how many targets? Call, you how many targets? Moment. But I think I think that's still, uh, I only have catches. Okay. No, but All I right. think that's to Ryan's point. And Ryan, you uh, that's fair because he did make catches when you needed him to. And yeah. I think those 16 he catches, made some crazy probably like, catches, probably like 10 of them were first downs when we like had to have. Them. Yeah. And the other six were probably bubble screens that Lincoln loved um, or something like that. I don't know. But yeah. I, uh, I think I, it depends. Like, Mark, I kind of agree with you for like taking a step back. But I think it also depends on like what you mean by that. Like, what does it mean to take a step back? Because I think for for someone like Drake Stoops, if you're making those big catches like he did last year, like that might be enough. I mean, this guy is not going to be an all-star NFL receiver, right? So for me, it's, it's playing time. It's opportunity. Got it. So I'll be surprised if he's not on the field on the majority of third downs, but that's, if that's all you're doing, then, you know, you're not someone you're going to nearly as often as we will Marvin Mims or Jaleel sure. Farouk or sure. Theo Weiss. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where, where I was at with it. Um, I also, just because I did the research and I, I want to shout him out, JJ Hester out of the Tulsa area. He's a transfer from Arkansas. He's another big bodied six, four guy. And I mean, maybe the change of scenery is all he needed, you know? Yeah. Uh, maybe he's the one who can take that that big, tall X receiver role uh, as well as one of those freshmen. Okay, let's move on to some tight ends. Matt Gann, tell me if I should care about anybody other than Braden Willis. You should. And the guy okay. I chose, transfer, Daniel Parker, 6'2", 250. And I think he's – I mean, listen, guys, I've seen some pictures. This man is jacked. He looks like he might be a linebacker. I was actually surprised. Scary. I think he was mic'd up during one of the uh, the practice sessions, and it's always great when players are mic'd up. It's hilarious to listen to. But Daniel Parker was mic'd up, and I legit didn't even recognize him at the moment. You can tell that these guys have just had a massive offseason, and he's gotten some good numbers from Missouri. I think he's going to be more of a blocking tight end because I think Brandon Willis is more of the, the catching receiver out of the duo. But I think he's going to get some good time, and we need to buff up the offensive line, especially during the run game. And I think Daniel Parker is going to be an absolute great fit for that into in duo with uh, Brandon Willis. Ryan? Yeah, I mean, like, I'm pretty sure I picked Braden Willis this year to win – potentially the the top tight end of the year um, i think he did yeah i think i did so like 15 I'm, catches last year <laughs> i'm very high on Braden willis this year guys i don't really have a reason to be but i'm just like extremely high on him and i think like this is his year that he is going to be utilized i've just seen for so many years this oklahoma offense has had so many great tight ends that we've been able to utilize to get to championship games and i just I just see this being Willis's year. Um, I also really like, like, this is a heavy freshman class for tight ends, right? I mean, you got Caden Helms, you got Jason Lewin, like some people Llewellyn. are coming in, Llewellyn, however you say his name. Um, you got people coming in, big guys, 6'5". I think they're both 6'5". Like, Jason's like 250 something, I think. Um, I mean, again, like I said this with the wide receiver group, but there's a lot of freshmen that are coming into this class that I think can make an impact, not only on the offensive side, but on the defensive side. That's the thing is the freshman at this position. I think Braden Willis isn't a known commodity. I think there's a lot to tap into there, but I also think we've seen Braden Willis play really well. It's just that last year was the weirdest year in OU history. Yeah. And, uh, he was also playing alongside Jeremiah Hall, who basically played the same position, but could do a little didn't. bit more. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like could same do position, more. but didn't. Yeah, like Braden Wills. Uh, Braden Willis just there were less opportunities. Yeah, is the big thing. I'll be excited to see how someone as physically gifted as he is can translate to being the clear number one receiving option at tight end. I also think one of these freshmen are going to get the chance to make a name for themselves. And it'll be interesting to see who that ends up being, what ends up happening there. I get Mark Andrews vibes like crazy out of Jason Llewellyn. He just, that that big old corn-fed white guy looking vibe is, uh, I he wants to plop down eight yards off the line of scrimmage and catch a football and get tackled. 
And I love that so much. So I, you know, between him and Helms, excited to see maybe someone step up. So for me, he's got a Braden Willis. I should say Braden Willis has got to get better at blocking. It's it's a position that does two things, and you got to block and you got to catch. And he can't he can't block that well. That's why I didn't play last year. That's why it was Jeremiah Hall, and it was Jeremiah's Hall. Jeremiah's Jeremiah Hall's job to lose. This year, it's Braden's job to lose. He knows what was in front of him. He knows he had to get better blocking. He's still the number one tight end on the roster, so you got to assume that he got at least somewhat better. The receiving has never been an option. We know he's talented enough to catch the ball and and score when he needs to, but he's got to be able to block. And if he can't, I think they're going to, like Mark said, put in one of these young guys or put in the transfer like like Matt said. That's He knows what's in front of him. He's a four-year guy. They're not going to save his feelings if it's going to hurt the team, like he's, he's got to be better. And I think he will be, I don't know how much better, but he'll be better. The, I remember the reports early on Daniel Parker at a camp where that he was catching the ball better than they expected really? better than, than they thought he would. So that's good. Yeah. I hope that Braden Willis is blocking pretty good. I know. I, I don't know. I, I legit don't know, but we'll find out. All right, guys, we're going to do the offensive line, but we're going to do it all five positions. So, like, just we're not going to go through left tackle, right, left guard, center, right guard, right tackle, unless Mark wants to. Seems like he's ready to do that. Um, no, I, I put them all as O line. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. So, so we're just going to go through some offensive linemen you like, some you may not like. We'll start with Ryan. Go ahead, buddy. He wasn't ready. I wasn't, he wasn't ready. ready. So I I'm going to be honest with you guys. I wasn't ready. But here's what I'm going to say. He's not going to probably play this year. But Jake Taylor, I'm pretty sure went to my high school. And I just have to give a shout out to that. I think he's going to play this year. You think he's going to play this year? I mean, I don't know if he's going to be like in the starting five this year. But yeah. I... He's pretty... He's pretty... Has he gained has, has he gained some weight yet? He's, he's six, small. 6'2", 293. That's not small. He, uh, he's he's a freshman. 300, though. Last year, that wasn't small. So I know well, this is a different. I team. I know. I'm just saying, <laughs> for a freshman coming in, that's not bad. I think one Tyler Guyton is six seven three fifteen, massive. That's a big man. I want him to be all over the place. <laughs> yeah, but let him play fullback. You Dude, know, right? just do stuff. Oh, I know. Just do stuff. Apparently, all of our transfers, him, McCade Matower. And is there a third one or am I just making that up? Just I those two is, I well, I, you know, well, what? how about you ask the transfer guy? Cause that, that is, um, <laughs> he's ready. <laughs> Bang! Matt, get on yeah. it. Some no, the I mean, wagons with some transfers. Come on. Yeah. Hey, I, t- I told you, Mark, it's the year of the transfers. And I think these guys will make immediate impacts. Taylor Guyton coming from TCU six foot six. I think you said three fifteen. That's a big boy. Played eight games for the, the Horned Frogs last year and then became a tour, you said, coming from California, was all 12 or all Pac-12 second team, 6'4", over 305 pounds. These are some good – these are some big boys, and it reminds me a little bit of the team that won the Joe, the Joe Moore best offensive line group. These guys were big, they were physical, and they were punishing people. That is what I want to see. I want them to move people – and absolutely make some holes and protect DG. I think those guys will definitely make an immediate impact and definitely give some depth to the offensive line as well. The next great Oklahoma center is already here. We started with Gabe Biker, Then we moved to Ty Darlington. And then it was Creed Humphrey. And now it's Andrew Rame. Andrew Rame is all of those offensive lines that were led by those guys that I just mentioned – were fantastic offensive lines, and that's because the guy centering and anchoring that offensive line was one of the better ones on on that field. Not better in terms of going to be the best NFL pro or anything like that. A leader that you need at the center position, and they believe in Andrew Rame. He's a third-year player. He's going to be a third-year starter, going to be a four-year starter because he's going to come back next year, and he's massive. He got bigger, stronger, faster. He's going to be the anchor of this offensive line. And I cannot wait to see him bully some people because he looks good out there. I'm ready for injury. I need to make a correction. 
I got the freshman Jakes mixed up. Jacob oh, Sexton, went, Sexton went into my high school. So Man. that's the dude I'm rooting for. <laughs> okay. I like it, Ryan. It's Mark. an old starting five now, and I like that. It, it looks like everyone that we have is going to be at least a redshirt sophomore or older. I couldn't tell you everyone's game experience, but that is something that gives me a little bit more confidence than the reverse where you've got a bunch of young guys trying to figure it out together. Yeah. So I'm, and I think that that goes back to young guys figuring it out together. Bill Beanbow has a guy at his center position who's locked in, who knows how Bill Beanbow coaches. And he, that's a guy Bill can go to and be like, we got to get our stuff together. And Andrew's going to be like, it's time to get our stuff together. And they're going to listen to him because he's a guy who's been there, done that, and he's older now. So mm-hmm. that's why another reason why I'm excited about Andrew. Anybody also, else on the offensive I, side? I mean, I, I also am just excited to see like this offensive line this year, you know, with Schmitty, um, like, and, you know, we weren't great last year. Obviously, that is very like clear. And there's some big changes that need to happen on the O-line. And we we still are like not sure exactly how they're going to be. So I'm just insanely excited to see this because this is what OU and Beanbow has been like known for is like great offensive lines. And if we're going to win another championship, we need one. So I'm just excited about it. Yeah, Mark. One guy I'm rooting for is Bray Walker. Former five star. Really, really hyped guy when he came in. Yeah. Has never really hit the ceiling that you wanted him to. But he's six foot seven, 359 pounds. He's a redshirt senior. Yeah. He is a grown, large man. Yeah. I just hope that he can get on the field and be grown and large. I, I love seeing that on the football field. I hope so too. Let us know who you think. On the offensive line, who's going to stick out? Who is not going to make the cut? What do you think? There's not a cut, but you know what I mean, to the starting five. All right, let's move on. Defensive line, moving to the defensive side of the ball. Start with the defensive line. We're talking DNs, D tackles, nose tackle, and the other defensive end. So we'll start with Mark. Mark, go ahead. Who who sticks out to you that you're most looking forward to? Yeah, make sure to take my guys again, okay? <laughs> Rivalry. Rivalry. <laughs> Ryan, nice. <laughs> just like I didn't even do anything to him that time. <laughs> I know. I'm just messing with you, Mark. I appreciate the setup. That was a good setup, and I hit the home run off you. Yeah, so I appreciate it. Oh my God. I thought he was going to start talking. I, I thought know, he was just going to take Mark's spot. It just sank it. Oh, <laughs> He's like, I appreciate really the setup. And then he just goes in. It would have been really good. It would have yeah, been really, really good. To you. <laughs> so I'll remember that. It's, it's not just me who's excited about Ethan Downs, but there's one thing that I that I think I, he has put on 30 pounds, like yeah. actually 30 pounds since he signed last year. And that is an incredible amount of physical growth out of a young man who showed really crazy athleticism in spurts last year. They expect him to take a big step forward, and I think that they will too. I also want to point out Two guys, uh, Jonah Aulu from Hawaii and my guy Jeffrey Johnson from Tulane. They're both transfer guys, seasoned, ready for action. Both transfer guys. Along right. the defensive mm-hmm. line. This is the best shit for and, Mark. And uh, <laughs> it's, you know, they're just, they're guys that you're kind of thinking, hey, they can step in and be ready to go. We also have three freshmen coming in, ready to contribute. Matt? Did you have stuff on the freshman? <laughs> uh, no, I, I told you I was more of the transfers, <laughs> but we might as well just call it the Mark Hall preview show at, at this point since he's going to take everybody. So go ahead, Mark, continue. No, you're right. Mason, what do you got, man? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Look, man, I'm fired thing, up. Hold on. We were talking about Ethan Downs. Um, they took him to media day, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. He was like one of the four, I think. Sophomore. Very yeah. well-spoken yep. guy. Like yep. that, Very well-spoken. Like that means something to me. Whether Very much it, it should. translate to like on field, um, like performance, we'll see. But it definitely translates to at least like how he is representing himself in the locker room for his coaches, everything along those lines. I I think he's going to have a big year. And congratulations to him on his engagement. Congratulations, Matt. I'm not going to take a transfer. I'm just going to mention one guy that I'm 
very excited about. And it's, it's somebody that everybody's going to be excited about. And it's Reggie Grimes. I just feel like he has, there's an opportunity in front of him to wreak havoc on opposing quarterbacks and running backs in the backfield. And I think Reggie Grimes has the ability, the gifts, the talent, the motor to be the guy who we thought he was going to be coming into OU. And that's a guy who is a world-class talent. And I think Miguel Chavis, Todd Bates have worked with him well. He looks like a completely different player in camp. A lot of the guys do. I mean, you look at before and after pictures of some of these guys and you see them, what the media is taking of them at practice. Reggie Grimes looks like a new player and I'm fired up for Reggie Grimes. Fired up. All right, go ahead, Matt. No, and, and Mark mentioned, I appreciate it, Mark, because you've done your research. You're good at it. I'm a big I setup guy. Brother. Big setup guy. Alley digger oop. Wanted to just compare some similarities because I think this is what we expected from BV to bring from Clemson. It's all about in the trenches, right? So speaking on Jonah, the transfer from Hawaii, 6'5", 271. Jeffrey Johnson, 6'2", 313. Are these guys offensive linemen or defensive linemen? I am loving how big these guys are. This is not something we've had in a long time. Obviously, we've got some much needed depth for Jalen Redmond on the defensive line, but these guys, these boys are big on both sides of the trenches. That's what I like to see. That was the formula that worked at Clemson. You saw how that how well they've done for the past 10 years. I love that he's bringing it already in the first year, even with these guys that are transferring in. They're not even his recruits. I love to freaking see it. Some big boys down getting it doing some dirty work on the lines dirty work done in the dark isn't that what their uh phrase was mm-hmm. dirty hard work done in the dark that's what yeah that's what it is yeah, it's the it is. you think brent knew he had to right, right. when he was like yeah. no let's put this on a shirt and do you think like everyone else just went along with it while demarco kind of chuckled yeah, yeah so it was I like <laughs> it, m- m- the hardest thing about that for me was like it was their first one it was like the first shirt that like came out once Brent took over. And I was like, why is this the one that we're going to like start with? This doesn't need to be the shirt that we start with. Okay. Hey, while we're on the defensive line, I know I yes. keep doing this, man. No. I'm sorry, but it's all good. Uh, this is the show. One this cool, <laughs> one cool thing. And this isn't even a defensive line thing. Really. It's Brendan Walker who was a sophomore defensive lineman out of, I guess, junior defensive lineman out of Oklahoma city had to retire medically and the staff is bringing him on as a defensive yeah, assistant super cool. as a yeah. student. Just think that's super cool and a, a really re- great way for him to keep his scholarship while remaining around the team and stuff. The staff really gets what they're doing with these guys. Mm-hmm. Bingo. Let's move on to some linebackers. This is probably in my opinion, the, the most important position on the defense because it's the one Brent's going to have have his hand in the most. And if they aren't performing well, I feel like the defense won't perform well in general. So just overall, for me, the position has got to be so important to the success of not only the defense, but the success of the team. That's why I think Danny Stutzman is a great guy to anchor that linebacker room. I I'm very excited to see how Danny looks. Anybody else? Guys, I am. Uh, this is the one class or one um, position I was referring to to talk about the freshmen. I am so excited about these three freshmen that are coming in. Um, you know, Jaron Kanak looks like a, I, I don't even know, like a monster. He's insane. Some of those videos that you're seeing of him in the weight room is terrifying. Um, Kobe McKenzie, massive dude. He just looks huge. Um, and then Kip Lewis. I mean, all of them are studs. And even if they don't get like their opportunity this year, which I think some of them might, um, I think they're going to be so great. And they set a perfect standard for like Brent's first year here and like what he's trying to bring into this organization at this position. So, and then Danny Stutzman, I completely agree with you, Mason. I think he's the anchor and he's the leader in that. I know we have Deshaun White, who's incredible, but like from a presence perspective, I think Danny has done a lot of work this year to show that he is leading kind of especially those three incoming freshmen. 
I'm going to have to disagree with you boys. Okay. On this one. Uh, and listen, I'm going to butcher his name. You guys already know who I'm talking about. Awake, Awake Boo. Is that how you say his last name? David Aguebu. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm terrible at saying names just for, for the viewer and the audience. He, I think he's got to be the guy that's got to be the anchor. He's experienced. He's a big guy. He's led the team before. I think he kind of, I wouldn't say reminds me of Kenneth Murray, but, and Jordan Evans, but that's the kind of guy we need playing the linebacker spot who's going to anchor. And I think a is going to be that guy. And I, uh, again, I love the tandem of Stutzman as well, but I think it's got to be a wake boot. I think he's going to be the guy who's on the field, going to be the quarterback of the defense. But like Ryan said as well, we got some exciting freshmen, the Jared connect. I mean, his story about, wanting to come and be the asking for for Dabo's blessing you know what obviously what a genuine thing to do but he wanted to come to OU and play 6'2 221 four star and just like you said as well Kobe McKenzie 6'2 236 another four star as well we got a lot of depth at the linebacker position so it'll be exciting to see uh which freshman steps up with David and with Stutzman as well my turn? Is yep. it my turn? Yep. Me? Yep. Yeah. Jaron Kanak or Kanak. I've heard it Kanak by everyone until tonight. So I'm going to say Kanak <laughs> is uh, the person that I really want to zero in on. They are reporting that he'll play the cheetah role in this defense, which is like, think Isaiah Simmons. Think kind of your roamer. Yeah. But instead of it being Bob Sanders or Troy Polamalu, he is 6'4, 220. Or with Jaron Kanick, 6'2", 220, with, you know, size to put on more, apparently. I think if they can unlock his athleticism and he comes to up to speed quickly on this defense, he is going to unlock a whole new level for them. And as, insofar as versatility, not bring, needing to bring guys on and off the field, insofar as what kind of looks you can show with the same guys on the field. You know, if he can put his hand in the dirt and someone else stands up, that's just something different you're throwing at him. I think that he brings something new to this linebacker room that we haven't had in uh, quite a long time. One other really quick thing is Danny Stutzman is listed as the same size as David Aguebu. They are literally both 6'4", 237, or 238 on the official roster. And that was a surprise to me. I didn't know Stutzman was quite that big. I'm excited to see if he got that big and can still move around as well as he could last year. Perfect. All right, boys. On to uh, defensive backs. Can't remember. Did we decide we were doing just defensive back group? Or are we splitting safeties and corners up? And we they're on the size of a big group. They're on the roster as listed DBs. all as DBs. Yeah. yeah. So. so- so I'll start, I'll start us off. My biggest question mark with the defensive back group is who's your other corner? You know, who one's going to be Woody Washington in my mind. So, and I'm sure that he's the guy that is locked in, but who else steps up? You know, who steps up on the other, on the other side of the ball? Is it going to be one of those young guys? Cause key Lawrence, isn't going to be that guy anymore. They moved him to safety and mm-hmm. Billy Bowman is going to be the other safety. So who's, who's the cornerback who steps up? Is it going to be that constant turnstile that we've seen in the past of just playing a bunch of guys till they figure it out? I don't think that's Jay Valai. I think Jay Valai is going to know who that number two guy is and lock him in. But um, right now, I don't know. I have no idea. The reports out of practice are like three different guys are playing well and they don't really know. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, I mean, we got three transfers in at the the cornerback position. Trey Morrison from North Carolina, 5'9". C.J. Colden from Wyoming, 5'11". And Connie Walker, Louisville, 6'2". So guys with good playing experience, let's see who's going to step up in tandem with Key Lawrence and Billy Bowman, who, like we've already talked about, BV called Billy Bowman specifically out for his gameplay in practice and being the de- best player on the defensive side. That's saying quite a bit for some of those guys who are already there. So is it going to be like last year? We got DJ Graham still. We haven't even mentioned his. Yep. Eaton, who's another big guy that that played okay last year as well. So there's a lot of depth. It's just who's going to be that consistent performer in that position. I think C, or cornerback's got to be one, if not the toughest position, other than playing quarterback. Uh, I just 
it's got to be, I mean, you got to be athletic. I mean, you got to be smart. I mean, it's incredible what those guys have to do on a play-by-play basis. So let's see if one of the transfers can step up, especially with their playing experience and see who, who ends up playing. I also think this group is like the, the, the coaches are going to let these freshmen play some, I think they're going to get reps Mm -hmm. and it, I, it would not surprise me to see Jaden Rowe get on the field a bit and show off his athleticism if they see it in practice. Right. And we're not in practice, so we're not seeing it, but between him, Gentry Williams, Robert Mm -hmm. Spears Jennings, we have guys in the defensive backfield that are young, but are obviously highly touted, highly thought of, and it'll be fun to see if they can get on the field. The fact that Billy Bowman's only a sophomore and uh, uh, Key Lawrence is what a junior, yeah, right transfer junior, junior. Yeah. yeah, junior. You know, the it's going to be it's going to be spot stuff if those guys are playing as well as you hope they are. But yeah. it, hopefully, you see those freshmen, you know, break out a little bit. This is mm-hmm. big. Before we get to Ryan, reminder to everyone listening, the red shirt rule goes back into effect this year. So you have four games, four appearances that you're allowed to make. If you make five appearances, you can't red shirt. So mm-hmm. that's going to be something to keep an eye on down the line, just because Mark said about wanting to play those younger guys. I agree you're going to want to, but when do you play them? Like I, that's going to be a chess game that will be interesting to see played throughout the year all right go ahead ryan sorry buddy yeah no you're good i mean i i think you guys have covered most everything um my 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 big thing here again we've talked about this we talked about it last week billy bowman bv does not call out individuals frequently he does not so like if that's happening something is going on that he is like looking at that and saying this dude is doing something special and i want to see that in action so I have very high expectations for him and I have very high expectations for that safety position with him and Key Lawrence. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I, I, I said that there was two position groups that I was super excited about the freshman, but every time we keep going through these, I get really excited about the freshman. So I like, I'm just excited for this team and how new it is. And I feel like we have so many creative options that like we as fans, as much as we love OU football are going to like, we've never experienced this before. This is a completely new coaching staff. This is a completely new playbook. This is completely new everything. And that's just super exciting. And imagining these big guys coming in um, to do this, like Gentry Williams being six feet, like Jane Rose, six foot two, like that's exciting. So I'm, I'm just pumped about all of this. And as we're going through each position, I just get more and more excited. I know. I feel like as we go through each position, I feel better. (laughs) because all my questions I feel like you guys kind of answer for me so it makes me feel better because I'm like oh okay well I didn't think about that solution or I didn't think about that guy that that's that's good to remember all right before we move on from the preview portion of the show special teams anybody want to mention anybody know who our kicker is going to be I just I just need to get a special shout out to Michael Turk you know we're going to talk about him he's a punter he's great It, it the what he's able to do with punting that ball is crazy, but also just like, I'm pretty sure I listened to, I think it was Eichert who said he's like going after the combine bench yeah. press, you know, record, all of that just doesn't look like a punter. And no. I I also think he brings just a really great energy to the team, which I think is exactly what BV is doing and exactly like what he wants and is probably egging that on. So um, yeah, I, I, I think we're going to see great things out of Turk as much as we can out of a punter. He's six foot two forty. He's got to be he's massive. He's got to be Schmidt's favorite punter ever. Oh yeah, <laughs> built like a brick shit house. Yeah, he's massive. He's just a large human. Matt, anything to add on the special teams front, sir? Uh, this might be the first time we truly don't know who our kicker is going to be. Yeah, I have no this, idea. No idea. I could not tell you. So that will be just an interesting because obviously last year. It was uh, it was hard to watch at times. Uh, it was the, especially the back half of the year with, with the Gabe, damn burrito, so the damn, damn burrito. the dang burrito just just ruined everything. So who knows? I, I love that Michael Turk's the only preseason Big Twelve. So a lot of people, you know, that's a lot of haters for sure. But hey, good for Michael Turk, and uh, we'll just have to see who's going to be kicking field goals, and hopefully someone can can come out and break out. Okay. 
that's going to do it for our preview portion of the show. Be sure to comment below on our YouTube video. Who do we miss? Who do you think is going to play well in this 2022 season? Reminder, next week we're previewing the game. So come on Bang. back next week. We're previewing an actual football game. This is Real the last in actual. This, is the, this is the last off-season program guys podcast of the 2022 calendar year. Time right. to see if we're good at this. <laughs> I know, right? This is the first time. The I first know. time we've ever done it with with actual. I'm glad we got the reps in. <laughs> Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. I'm glad we like got comfortable and all of exactly. that stuff, you know. Ooh, I'm, never, I'm never comfortable with Mark on here. The rivalry, always, man. Always, it is just you, it, this is a one sided thing, man. <laughs> I know it's crazy. Ryan, do you want to do you want to give us something to watch this week or, or are we saving it for next? I, I what, what what time are we at? What time are we at? Uh, How we, are we got, feeling? Uh, we got like 10 minutes left. Hold off because I want to watch it first. Okay, we're gonna, okay, we're gonna like talk about it. Give, so give it to give it two episodes. Yeah, so can okay, I like mention fair. what I'm going to talk about? So, guys, I'm not going to be on next week's pod. I'm going to Hawaii. Um, so you will what get flex. three episodes right. to um, sit on this one for you. But my okay. next one is going to be House of the Dragon, um, mm. the new Game of Thrones television show that premiered on Sunday night, Sunday, August 21st on HBO. Um, so please, my MVP is actually going to mention this a little bit, but I won't get in the spoilers. Um, please watch it. Keep up with it. It's the next water cooler show of this year slash last three years since Game of Thrones went off. Yeah, there hasn't been um, one since Game of Thrones. There hasn't been one. So, no. I mean, it's fantastic to be back in Westeros, people. And I know people might feel burned, but give it a shot. I'll talk about it more in, in two weeks. Okay, sounds great. Before we move on to our MVPs of the week, anybody seen the OUDNA special on ESPN Plus? They premiered episode one last week. It was 19 minutes long. They they marketed it as an all-access look at the OU program under Brent Venables. To me, it was a 20-minute highlight video of practice film and Brent talking in team meetings. They, they marketed it as like a hard knocks sort of thing, and it's just not that. They sometimes do player interviews, but it's nothing that you would care about. I'm very upset that they did that because it's like the first thing that they're putting on there that's like uniquely OU mm -hmm. Sooner Vision content and it's crap. It's just not good. I Maybe. wondered what kind of access they would really get, right? I mean, because players are mic'd up and stuff. Like that's cool, but like you don't, you don't, they don't talk about their transition, like how they went through their off season, like player interviews and coach interviews. I wanted to hear that and they don't even do that. Dude, well, I maybe keep they're thinking, saving something. Maybe. I keep thinking, when is Joe Castiglione going to reach out and just embed us into the program Dude, and I have know. us do all of that? <laughs> we'll talk to players every day. It doesn't matter. Guys, Bring us on board, Joe. Can you imagine Gan out there on the field running with the mic? Just being Dude, like, hello. Uh, I would like to be it. electric. It'd be electric. It'd be so I've been, I've been running. Like, Get him in the V drill. <laughs> You've been I running, keep, Matt? I, hey, I've been running. I could keep up with those boys. I've been <laughs> running every day, baby. Oh, my God. All right. Let's get to the PGP MVPs of the week. <sighs> let's go to Academy and get some pads and, like, really <laughs> do this. What do you I'm think? I'm down, Mark. Mark, right, like that's the only can thing we, I'll agree can we, uh, Wait, can we um, live stream it for our, for our listeners? Absolutely. Yeah, well, the I mean, rivalry. That, that has rivalry. never gone well. So let's just, like, video <laughs> it. Me and Mark okay. will do the, me and Mark, so looks yeah, me and Mark will do the Oklahoma drill. Ooh, oh, nice. I, oh, Ooh, I'd yeah. Love to. That actually that would be so fun. I'd love I will, to. I will film you guys. I would. I'm going to start preparing. I would rock you. <laughs> we're we're going to wow. figure out the details to this. Wow. And I am so wow. excited for it. Okay, wow. let's let's figure it out and we'll, we'll wait. Do it. Can All that right. be our? Can I? Can that be our bi week content? We'll, we'll get. We'll, we'll get. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll get there when we get. We'll there. get there. Matt we'll get there. is on record now. <laughs> as being real confident so i'm excited for those <laughs> okay mvps of the week ryan go ahead you're up yeah uh this is gonna be very short um my mvp of the week is matt smith he's an actor who plays damon targaryen in house of the dragon um you might recognize him as doctor who um he was doctor who for a very long time he's in a lot of other things a great british actor um and he's fantastic in this show and he's got the best character George R. R. Martin, who wrote 
Game of Thrones wrote everything, says this is like his favorite character. So he's awesome. He gives a great performance. Go watch House of the Dragon. We'll talk about it in two weeks. Is he the one in the front of all the like promotional stuff? That's not the girl. Yeah, he's the long hair guy. Um, he's Dude, wearing his, like his the face helmet. and head is bothering me a lot. So, <laughs> um, I was hoping it's he'd be thing. like. I was hoping he'd be like the Ned Stark of the series. Yeah, it's, he's a he's a but, great he's a great actor. So just give him a shot, man. See the same dude who's in the crown and he's Prince yes. Philip. Yes. Yeah, dude, he's got a weird face, man. Yep. I I'm don't like it. That. Mm-hmm. Nah, that guy. That guy's face is weird, man. He's got oh, his face. Just give him a shot, guys. Give him a shot. All right, Maggie. Not Maggie. MVP. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna keep it short and sweet as well. I'm going with Southwest Airlines. Okay, everyone knows at the bachelor party, I had a six o'clock flight the day after you didn't all tell the festivities. Me. That's crazy. Yeah, all the festivities were over, so I had to get Did up anyone at know that? 4 o'clock at, in the dawn. I found out my flight was delayed, which was going to mean I was going to miss my connecting flights. A very nice gentleman found me a plane ticket, got me home when I needed, especially before all the storms. We've had a lot of rain in Dallas. I am just was so happy just to be home. It was a long weekend. A great fun weekend to say, but shout out to Southwest for finding me a, a flight to, to get back home. Perfect. All right. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to go with the graduating class of Jinx High School 2011. (laughs) I met the gang this weekend. That's right. I had a blast doing it. The boys, man. Everyone was a lot of fun. Uh, I had met a handful before, but not really spent much time. And it's always fun at like bachelor parties when the groups vibe. And you had pretty distinctly two different groups there, right? Very much so. Man, it worked really well. Really had a good time meeting everyone and uh, hope they're all listening. Can't wait for the wedding. Wow, which wins. group Which group was I a part of? Uh, uh, you were the third group, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you there was the third. a third. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had my own group. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I want you to think about what the name of that group is, and that's exactly right. You're exactly right. I'll get back to you guys on it. Sounds good. All right. My MVP of the week. I just watched the documentary series on Manti Teo and his uh, catfishing saga. Man, I probably got some. Please no one go look at my old Twitter, but I probably got some really crappy takes about Manti Teo. And I apologize big time to that guy because. First of all. How deep it went and for how long it went, I thought it was just like a six month thing. So. No, this was like a three year thing that he was like talking to this person during and seeing the people who went from this guy got catfished to, oh, wait, he did it on purpose. Oh, wait, he did it because he's gay is just like wild. By the way, he's married to a woman now. So like all those things are terrible to say about a person. But in hindsight, Manti Teo to deal with all of this. And it obviously affected him, affected his NFL career, affected everything to like be through this. This is why he's my MVP. He wanted the documentary series to be made. He insisted that the man now transgender woman who catfished him be included in the series because he wanted people to hear both sides of the story and not just Manti's and feel bad for Manti. Manti wanted you to also understand where the person who was catfishing him came from and wanted to be involved with someone so like just kind of wild that's why like spo- thanks for spoiling uh, it I know. sounds like we have a must watch this week mason it's really good Ooh. it's really good mark you shook your head is he a bad mvp no no no, no. man Teo is a is a good mvp i i watched it too i was not a fan of how much naya the uh yeah catfisher was you know not ever really like i I, how do you push back on something in that kind of context right but her explanations were generally i was doing something that i wanted to do because it made me happy and Mm. uh, that's just it's tough when there's another life at stake here that's where it that just bothered me the catfishing is bad people don't catfish catfish is bad all right And with that, 
Episode 33 is a wrap. Be sure to like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Try to get to 1,000 subs by the end of the year, folks. Up over 650 this week. Keep on doing it. We appreciate you. We read every comment that you leave on our YouTube channel. Please keep commenting. Let us know about what you thought about the preview this week. Looking forward to next week's episode. Be sure to like or follow us on Twitter at Program Guys with a Z. On Instagram, Program Guys with a Z. YouTube, Program Guys Podcast. Facebook, Program Guys Podcast. However you get your podcast, that's where you can find us. Rate us five stars. Leave us a solid review. That's going to do it. All right. Who's taking us out? Matt. Matt. Keep pushing it, baby.